Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, Sahavir Yang Karawahe, Tejasvina Vajamastu, Bavid Vishawahe, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Summary up to this point. Two sessions ago, not the last one, we said that <clears throat> the I is distinct from the body, mind, sense complex self, the true I. And at the same time, this I has a special relationship with this body, mind, sense complex. And because of this relationship, there is this sense of unceasing pursuit of freedom. And the pursuit doesn't leave until this relationship is looked into because this relationship is what's making me feel bound. So then we negated the, through a different a formula, we negated the body, mind, and senses. And after this negation, what remains is awareness, consciousness. And in Sanskrit, this is chit. So I am awareness, which is not qualified by the body, mind, sense complex. And because it is not qualified, it is thus not affected nor displaced by the ongoing changes of the body, mind, sense complex. So how do you validate this? Okay, nice, nice statement, Andre. How do we show this? How do we demonstrate this directly? We said that during absence and presence of thoughts, your thoughts we're talking about, awareness is true. That awareness that is true, I am. If it wasn't I, then who would be left to recognize the presence and the absence of thoughts? So something's left to recognize that. Thus, I am independent of thoughts belonging to this person, belonging to, from your standpoint, to that person. The I also cannot be memory because nobody has to remember I am. <laughs> Do you have to remember that? Hmm, I am, that's right. Oh, let me go downstairs in the garage and just remind myself, I am. Okay, okay, I've got to hold this in my head all day. It's effortless. <laughs> Even upon amnesia, your whole life goes. Even your name. But the fact that I exist remains true. Even to a healthy mind as much as to a mind with amnesia. You can forget everything, but cannot forget your own existence because it is self-evident. Meaning, I am independent, free of the thoughts of memories because I cannot forget myself. We also said the I cannot be Ahamkara, that is the I sense. Why? Because the I sense is another function of the mind. And its only function is to capture and localize experiences to a single body mind complex without confusing it to another body mind complex. Another reason is the I sense 
disappears in deep sleep. But I don't go out of existence in deep sleep. Does anyone go out of existence in deep sleep? Okay. If you went out of existence in deep sleep, what would be the problem with that? You would be afraid to go to sleep because you would know you would go out of existence. In fact, the only reason we go to sleep is because we know the same presence that I know myself to be right now will be also present tomorrow. You know that confidently. So, he's still online with me. Yeah, but just froze the image, froze, but I can hear you. Okay. Can anyone shake your head if you can hear me? Okay, good. Yeah. Not another disconnection. Okay. So, there is the so there is knowledge that deep sleep is a state of nothingness everyone knows that it's a state of blankness there's nothing there nothing to know it is blissful ignorance no experience can you all relate to that yeah so the fact that there is knowledge of that the fact that you can relate to that means i pervade deep sleep also. Otherwise, nobody would be relating to what I'm saying. You'd be saying, well, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I only, I only dream. But you clearly know there's a difference between deep sleep and dream state. In fact, the only reason you go to close your eyes is not to dream, but to look forward to that little blissful ignorance. Ah, I am free. Not dreaming. So you clearly know that there is a distinction between deep sleep and dream. So we all look forward to deep sleep and not to the dream state. So what does this mean? It implies there is knowledge that during deep sleep, I am free of this limited person. And to look forward to deep sleep means there is a presence in whose presence the absence of duality is enjoyed. That's what sleep is, isn't it? There's no duality. There's no objects. It's just one without a second. So if there's a closest example that we have of non-duality, deep sleep. The only unfortunate thing is it is blissful ignorance. So I'm not even aware of myself to get to enjoy the lack of objects, the lack of duality. And we also know that it cannot be the mind that is enjoying deep sleep. Why not? Why is the mind not enjoying the deep sleep? Because there's no life story in deep sleep. There's no person. In fact, the only reason you go to deep sleep is to get rid of your story. <laughs> so there's no mind, there's no thoughts, there's no ahamkara, there's no memories in deep sleep. So what's the only other option left? Since we all still relate to deep sleep and the mind is not available in deep sleep and we all look forward to deep sleep, what does this mean? There is a connection to the presence that is pervading the deep sleep, that same connection I am at one with right now in the waking state. Which means what? I am the presence that is there during deep sleep, but also during this waking state. We know it cannot be in the mind because we explained there's no story, there's no thoughts, there's no experiences, there's no memories in deep sleep. In other words, I am the presence in whose presence the waking state, 18 hours, dream state, and deep state are all known to self, the presence, awareness. So awareness is present in 
all three states, dream, waking, which we're experiencing now, and sleep. And there's no connection between any of those three states. Is there any connection between dream and waking? Zero connection, except the mind's there. What about deep sleep and waking? Zero connection. So three worlds distinct of themselves, no connection whatsoever. And yet, I know about all three of them. Three different worlds, no connection. But who knows about them? I do, which means I pervade all three states. So whatever happens in any of those states, I am thus free of. Because if I wasn't free, then I would be taking all of my thoughts from the waking into deep sleep. But I am free of everything in deep sleep. Thus, I cannot be any of them. And where do all of our karmas happen? Waking state. All our punya papa karma accumulated in the waking state. And what do we just say now? I am the knower of all three states. Thus, whatever happens in all three states, I am free of, independent of. This means there's not a single person here that has any karma. Because karma is waking state. Just another state, just like dream state, like deep sleep state. Nothing special. Just one of the three worlds. So the next question that we brought up is, is this awareness that we speak of limited? Right, so this presence, is it limited? And we said, no, it's not limited. It is not bound by the body-mind. It has no start and end. Even though it appears as though bound by the presence of the body and the mind. We use the cup example. Remember? The space inside the cup. As though appears limited by the boundaries of this cup. But in actuality, the space inside this cup, that is the awareness, is actually not different from the total space that embodies all cups. But it appears like it's limited only to the presence of the cup. We discussed this. And we also say that any limitation that we give to awareness is in reference to either the body or the mind. Remember that? My awareness is limited. But you're referring to a limited mind, to a limited cognition, limited memory. My awareness is painful. <laughs> when you're referring to some pain in the body or some psychological pain. So all awareness is one. There's no all, it's just one awareness, free of boundaries. Now the next question was, okay, that's nice, sounds good. But then how do you explain the presence of this universe? How did this body-mind come about? How did this universe come about? And that's where we were at last session, remember? Okay, so before I resume, I want to re-encapsulate the context why we are doing this inquiry. The reason is because the mind, before learning anything, this is a nice tip for all of us, before you learn anything, you need to just take a moment and ask, what is the relevance of what I'm about to learn to my life? In what way does it fit? How is it going to actually transform my life? What's the relevance to me right now? So this actually opens up your mind to listen, to, to want to take this knowledge in, you want, to, uh, you want to integrate it. If we don't do this, then it's just sort of, okay, okay, let's just go through this. Sounds interesting, sounds good. The moment it ends, you know, you're on to the next thing. So let's ask, what is the relevance of this inquiry for you, for me, for us? If you don't have the big picture of the total universe, then small things become big. Everything becomes a big deal. You know, who's the next president? Let's talk about that. <laughs> and then when a new president comes, oh, okay, what now? So all life becomes about so many things that are constantly coming and going. Why? Because I don't have the big picture. If I do have the big picture, well, we'll, have, we'll talk about what happens if you do have the big picture. But if I don't have the big picture, 
Then stress guaranteed because so many things to address, right? So many things to look into. And that's, that's stressful. You know, it brings fatigue, mental fatigue. The other disadvantage is if I'm constantly distracted, uh, not having the big picture is you get confused and consumed by so many thoughts, uh, so many schools of thoughts. For example, someone brings to you yoga and asana and you go, okay, very important. I need to do that. Pranayama. Oh, okay. Super important. I need to do that. Uh, Siddhi, you know, powers. I want some of that too. I want some channeling, you know, the ascended masters. I definitely want to attend to those guys because they're way more advanced than we are on earth. So let's read their transcripts, their channeling material. Let's do some astral projection. Very fun. Some lucid dreaming. Let's mobilize our energies. Let's do some Tai Chi Chuan, some Qigong, some aura chakra cleansing. Let's open our third eye. Uh, let's do Kundalini raising. Like, let's reawaken the serpent. Uh, let's get into psychedelics. And so the list of things is endless. So it keeps the person engaged and interested in the small things. Not that they're useless, but we're just saying that it keeps the person endlessly engaged. Now, the challenge is when a person doesn't have the big picture, when you and I don't have the big picture, then all of these schools of thought, they, when they're practiced, then if you practice them without the knowledge of the big picture, they only create partial or temporary life transformation, but never full, complete, permanent, whole life transformation. For example, psychology and psychotherapy, wonderful practices. The challenge is, or the limitation of psychology is it still focuses on the framework that you are a limited individual bound to your body and your mind. So this means no matter how much psychology tries to fix, it is only fixing a temporary body mind, but it is not addressing the big picture. Therefore, what kind of transformation will you get? Only a partial or a temporary transformation, but not a permanent total identity shift. So again, all of these practices are wonderful when they are isolated to what they're meant for. Psychology, for example, is supposed to help the person deal with relative trauma, childhood memories, childhood love issues, abandonment issues, abuse issues, all of that is extremely important because without that, the person is not going to get into spirituality in the first place. So they do have their extremely important place. That's why Vedanta is not about putting anything down. It recognizes the importance of everything. But from the standpoint of the big picture, it still does not address the big picture, right? So they only deal with temporary sectors of the human uh, psyche. And the reason why they do not create this permanent transformation is because the person that is trying to get some help is already by nature, full, whole and complete. That means there's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> but I come in with an assumption, something is wrong with me. So this means that just by putting an action into the field, that is an assumption. I am presupposing that I am not full, whole, and complete. So it ends up being a self-defeating effort. In other words, I am going into a modality, trying to fix myself because I feel limited. And yet the very fact of doing that, I am reinforcing the idea that my nature is limited. So it's almost like a self-defeating effort after some time. I'm not saying it's going to like be that, like that forever because everyone comes to a certain point and says, okay, it's not time to move on and look for a teaching. So the question now is, how is the Bhagavad Gita or the Upanishads different? Right? What is so special about our teaching? So the Gita starts out with a big teaching, with a big picture, the fundamental question in which the individual 
person can fit in their story. It's kind of like a big puzzle piece, right? And the Gita shows you the big puzzle piece, the total picture. And then you see, ah, okay, so I'm just like one little piece. But now it doesn't, it's not that much of a bother, is it? Because there's a big vision of how my role actually has a place in the big picture. Now imagine if I don't have the big picture and I find myself in a little corner, you know, in the puzzle piece and there's some bird poop on there and I start complaining, oh, you know, I'm bird poop and everyone else is a flower and this person is a sunshine and, but I'm just a bird poop. Right? But now the relationship changes because it doesn't matter whether I'm a bird poop or the sunshine or the flower, I still have the big vision. So this means the entire relationship to life changes by having the big picture. So what kind of story does the Bhagavad Gita include, right? What's the story they say? They start out with the cause of the universe, which we discussed last week. The Gita corrects the notion that the cause is away from us, firstly. That is the fundamental correction that has to take place before anything else. Because as long as I think that the cause is away, then I find myself as a separate individual trying to navigate my way through this big picture, which I don't even have, which I don't even have yet to navigate. So the Gita provides this big picture. It also shows us that this cause pervades the entire universe. That means it also pervades the individual, you, the one that is trying to get help. So now this causes a different relationship. Hmm, then what is this cause? If this cause pervades me right now, then I want to investigate into this cause because the same cause is the cause of the entire universe. And this cause also supplies one form, the capacity to interact with another form. For example, the root is a form. It interacts with the water. The sun is a form. The earth is a form. The earth interacts with the sun. So this capacity is also supplied by this one cause. There is not one thing that is out of place in this universe if you look carefully. Nothing is just there doing, you know, oh, what are you doing in this universe? I don't know. It is engaged or interacting with something else. This is a fact. Now, the Bhagavad Gita uses a wonderful metaphor to demonstrate what's it like if you don't have a big picture. Imagine beads, many beads, which implies people and objects, and they're all strung around a string, which is Ishwara. Many beads around one string. Now, if you miss the connection to the string, which is in and through all beads, which means no beat is away from, then what kind of, what's gonna happen? You tell me. What are some of the challenges that could arise from not knowing that there is one string in and through all beads? Brain warm up, unmute, tell me. Yes, please, Robert. Uh, you would say every other bead is separate from yourself. Yes. And that's going to cause what kind of? Alienation, depression, lack of, lack of compassion, lack of love. Yes, excellent. Okay, what else would happen if the bead doesn't know about the connection of the one string? Inferiority or superiority? Yeah, excellent critic. Okay. So if I don't know about the one string that is not only through me, in and through me, but also in and through you, then the entire life focus from birth to death becomes about focus on other beads, talking about other beads, dating other beads, gossiping about other beads, being more superior or inferior to other beads, 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 all life, birth to death, Life after life, beads. What's going on? Well, it's a beady day. Tomorrow, it's a more beady day. Today was the less beady day. 
So this means that as long as I only focus on the beads, then I'm not going to investigate if there's anything more. So by knowing the connection in and through all beads, my relationship Im immediately changes. What else is going to happen if I don't know about the one string? I feel small, insignificant, and this produces psychological complications like jealousy, uh, seeking validation from others uh, because you feel isolated, as I think Robert said, in this universe. So I need to do something to get attention, uh, pretend to be angry just to get attention, uh, trying to become someone, uh, black or white linear thinking. Okay, all of this is a consequence of not knowing about the one string that is in and through everything. So this means no matter how much psychology I get, if I do not have that connection to that one string, then more worms are going to come through because they just never end, right? The more you dig, the more you find. And the more you find, the more you want to address. The more you address, the more you focus on the bees. The more I focus on the bees, the more my time and attention goes on anything other than the string. So it's a self-perpetuating cycle. And it becomes about me versus you because I am a bead, you're a bead. That's basically the basic state of the world. Me versus them. Anywhere we look, me versus them. Businesses, competition, you know, who's going to SEO each other, who's going to get number one on Google, that's also me versus them. Who's going to uh, be heard, that's also number uh, in reference to beadiness, okay? So this me versus them is hardly ingrained in society. Why? Because there is not knowledge, there is not clear knowledge of this one string. So again, before moving forward, how is the knowledge of Ishwara going to, or is relevant to our lives? How is it relevant to your life by having knowledge of Ishwara? The answer is we're all caught up in the notion, I am small, limited, unworthy, unloved, unimportant, insignificant, not good enough. These are all these fundamental psychological pressures that are constantly coming forward. And one can never free oneself from this sense of limitation until one discovers one's wholeness to the whole, one's not tooness from the one, one's unity with all. So this means when that relationship is discovered, then I get rid of this limitation. It's kind of like a real relationship between intimate partners. As long as there's some tension, why is the tension there? Because I'm not looking, I'm not taking my time to address what's going on in the relationship. And as long as I don't do that, the tension is sustained. When I sit down and I inquire with this other person, honestly, openly, then we come to the bottom of the issue and then the tension subsides. In the same example here, as long as my relationship to this body mind continues to be unaddressed, then this tension is sustained. Now, revision of Ishwara. This is what we talked about last week. We said that two factors, this is a new topic, two factors are required to create anything. In the case of a pot maker, in the case of a pot, you need two causes. One is the efficient or the intelligent cause. These are one in the same words called nimitta karanam. In the case of a pot, it is the pot maker, the one who has knowledge of pottery. This means I need knowledge of pottery to make a pot. But I also need the clay itself, the material, the upadana karanam. Thus, efficient cause and material cause equals final product. Now, in case of Ishwara, two causes that we just spoke of, nimitta karanam, upadana karanam, they are inseparable. We provided the logic last week, why? The efficient cause in Ishwara's case is that which puts together forms in larger assemblies. For example, wood. Wood consists of lignin and cellulose. In fact, I'm going to show you um, the practicality of the example. 
So it's more visual because we need some visuals for some reference. Open the screen share screen. Okay, let me see. Okay. So this is a list of molecules. Uh, you've got aspirin, you've got, um, which you probably heard before, you've got benzene. So let's type in cellulose here. Okay, cellulose. Now, if we look at the information of cellulose, you have six carbon, 10 hydrogen, and five oxygen atoms. Now you ask, okay, so exactly six carbon plus 10 hydrogen plus five oxygen equals cellulose. What does this mean? Who made this 10? Why not 11? Why not four oxygen? Why not five carbon? Because if it was one number out, higher or lower, it would not be cellulose. It would be a different molecule. Thus, the wood could no longer be wood because you need six carbon, 10 hydrogen, five oxygen to create cellulose. You need cellulose plus, plus lignin to create wood. You need wood to create trees. You need trees to sustain life and harbor, home for the birds, harbor leaves for the giraffes and so on. So if we look at this diagram of molecules, each one of them is dictated by a specific constituent of atoms coming together. For example, the aspirin we look at, let's see what aspirin is. We've got oxygen, how many? Nine. Hydrogen, eight. Four oxygen. But what was the last one? The, one, the last one of cellulose was six carbon, 10 hydrogen, and five oxygen. So you just change the numbers and you go from cellulose to aspirin, completely different. So this is what we mean by intelligence, which puts together molecules in order to create the next assembly, the next successive assembly upwards. But not only that, but if you look at any molecule, it contains the exact amount of atoms. So this, as we can see, is just pure intelligence. So two causes. One is the efficient cause, which I've just shown you. It puts molecules together to create the next successive assembly upwards in order to create a total form, which you then go, oh, tree, very nice tree. And then let's sit under the tree and enjoy ourselves. The second is the material cause. Now, if you look into any material form, any form whatsoever, that form is reducible to a smaller form. Meaning any form at any level, when I say form like the, uh, like the molecule, that's a form. But you look into that molecule and you go, okay, molecule, you look into it, what is it now? Six carbon, 10 hydrogen, five oxygen. But just a moment ago, I call it the molecule. Now I'm calling it atoms. And then you look into those atoms, I further reduce it into a smaller name form. Thus, name form within name form within name form within name form until it ultimately reduces to space itself. But space itself also is reducible to all knowledge, all power, which we explained last week, because what was there before time and space came. Thus, it also reduces into all knowledge, all power. So any form that you look at is nothing but name within name, form within form. And each for name form is, as we discussed last week, important, efficiently organized to produce the larger form with a useful function capable of interacting with another form, which is also reducible to molecules and particles all the way down to space, which ultimately results to all knowledge, all power. So both efficient cause or the efficient intelligent cause and the material cause is what we call Ishwara. So when you say Ishwara, what are we saying? Material cause and intelligent cause. Nimitta Karanam Upadana Karanam. Another name for Ishwara is all knowledge, all power. Sarvajna Sarvashakti. This is a common expression used in the Upanishads. Now, if you want to see this in action, 
this beautiful, um, it's quite fascinating actually from a biological standpoint, is uh, if you look at a sperm cell, you can do this on YouTube, you know, you can see the sperm cell, you know, looking for the egg. It's like fully alive, you know, wiggling. It's, it's intelligent going, where's the egg? Where's the egg? Let's find the egg. Now, does the sperm cell have a brain? <laughs> it is induced with that same intelligence. It doesn't go hunting for food in your stomach. It hunts for the egg. So what tells the sperm to hunt for the egg and not for the, you know, for the food or something else? Intelligence. So at every level we see, not only is it material, but also it is induced with, in and through, by this one all knowledge, all power, which we call Ishwara. Or if you look at the process of meiosis, cell division, you can also look this on YouTube, you know, when there's a process of creating a, a fetus, you have one single cell. What comes out of a cell? Two cells. So not only is there a process of splitting, which is intelligence in itself, but out of one cell, which has nowhere to borrow material from, out of it comes a second cell. So out of the one comes two. Therefore, wherever there is intelligence, there is simultaneously material itself. They all result, this means all material resolves into intelligence itself. Then we talked about how to appreciate the presence of Ishwara. And we answered by saying that the presence can be appreciated through the presence of laws and orders. We've discussed about different laws and orders last week. Let's take the biological. Destruction of species is also a biological order. For example, the dinosaurs. For the dinosaurs, what happened to dinosaurs? Well, who knows? But we know that they went dis uh, extinct. Why? So they can produce a pave way for mammals, which also paves way for humans. Thus, even the extinction, the many species that have gone extinct since the start of human life or sustainable human life on Earth, in itself is a order of itself, an intelligent order to give way to the new successive species. So there's no such thing as no order. It is also an intelligent order. We also talked about the two important orders, which are specifically mentioned in the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita, karma and dharma. Karma and dharma just means a cause-effect relationship. Action, reaction. And karma and dharma connects the past, present, and future in such a way that the future has a correlation to the past. Or the future has a correlation to not only a present, but also to the past. So there's a connection between them. It's not like the future is totally out of place and has no connection to today. So there's a connection between them. Now, in reference to a human being, to you and I, the law of karma and dharma provides the individual results in the form of pleasant and unpleasant experiences or situations which are unfolding for all of us every day. So if you woke up today feeling like kind of odd, that is an unfoldment of karma and dharma. Tomorrow you wake up feeling extremely fantastic, that is an unfoldment of your karma and dharma called prarabdha, karma. That's why we wake up out of no reason. There's no connection to yesterday. And you go, why is my back sore? Why do I have a headache today? I didn't do anything yesterday that made it possible to have a headache today. And yet I have a headache today. Why is that? Prarabdha karma is being exhausted. That means it just comes forward. So this is one way that we explain why we have these random situations come up in our life and there's no seemingly no connection to the past. Also, we need to mention that we cannot actually verify the presence of karma and dharma. The reason is because there is actually no way to access, the, you don't have access to all of the details of how actions right now have corresponded to or are connected to what I've done yesterday, what I've done five years ago, what I've done uh, you know, a la la last lifetime ago. So there's actually no way to verify this if you think about it. So then how do we then explain, prove this presence of karma and dharma? 
Well, we can do that through common sense. You can just say, if I do one thing today, then tomorrow, whatever day I get is going to be in accordance with what I've done today. It's simple as that. That means there's a carryover, a corresponding carryover in reference to the actions I've done today. And it's also important to know how the Upanishads work because Upanishads and Bhagavad Gita mention things like, like the karma and dharma. And you say, well, how do you now explain how do they actually work? Well, think about it this way. Whatever the Upanishads say, like the scriptures, the Vedas, whatever they say has to make logical sense if you inquire into it. And it cannot contradict if you look into it. That means they show you one thing. And if you look into what they show you, you discover, I actually cannot contradict it. So this also means it should not contradict my advanced reasoning, no matter how advanced it is. If I look into it sufficiently, it doesn't contradict it. While at the same time, the teaching should go above my reasoning. So not only does it not contradict my reasoning, but the logic in the Upanishads also goes above my own reasoning. And even when it takes me above to a new evolved reasoning, then my newly sophisticated evolved reasoning still cannot contradict the Upanishads. That's how they work. For example, have you ever seen a chess game? Like a chess, you know, a good move. You can add a thing to YouTube tonight. Good chess moves. Now, if you ever seen a chess game, you see a brilliant move being made, right? And you go, you know, this is such a brilliant move. Even though the entire chess board was right in front of me, I thought about the best possible move. But when I saw this brilliant move, I was like, wow, why didn't I think of this myself? So when the move gets made, it doesn't contradict your own rationale. And then when you discover that move, you go, okay, now next time I'm going to apply this move. And then you watch another chess game and then you go, okay, you know, now I'm smart. I've got this new move now. And then you apply that new move, but then someone else applies a better move. And you go, oh, why didn't I think of that? Even though the chess game was right in front of me, nothing was hidden from me. I missed the obvious. And when I saw this brilliant move, I discovered that it doesn't contradict the game itself. That's exactly how Upanishads work. They reveal what is obvious, but I miss it. That's why we cannot get the reality until we read the Upanishads or the texts which reveal the reality itself. Because our logic is simply not sophisticated enough until it gets the cues from the Upanishads. Um, another, for example, they say that uh, all forms resolve into uh, a smaller forms. And then you say, okay, now let's investigate that. And you see, okay, well, it is true. The rock does uh, resolve into, um, in the mountain does resolve into a rock. The rock, you know, you got the granite, you got pumice, you got quartz. But you look at a quartz, it also resolves into silicon and oxygen. And then silicon and oxygen further resolves into down the line. So it's not like they're making this false claim. They're saying what is obvious. And then if you investigate it, you say, ah, I understand now. Okay. Now the question is, um, another reason that karma and dharma can answer is the purpose of the universe. This is what Dave was asking last week. What's the purpose of the universe? How did it all come about? Why all this? Right? Very common question. Let's see what the law of karma and dharma says. Firstly, to say what is the purpose of the universe is not entirely a correct question. It actually comes from this Western thinking because to say what's the purpose actually implies that there was a first beginning, if you think about it. Even science will confirm and will say that there is no beginning. Nothing can be created nor destroyed. 
that means everything already is true right now. So there's nowhere material, there's nowhere anything to go. So how can you now say purpose? Because purpose implies it wasn't there, and now I go, hmm, let me create for some purpose. But you cannot think like that because nothing was missing. Everything already was true. So whatever exists, we'll start with the statement, whatever exists is already there. That's a fact. And not only the material is there, but also the intelligent laws and orders are there. For example, today is incomplete without tomorrow. You cannot think of today without tomorrow. So this means both the principle of today and tomorrow is already true. And tomorrow is a reflection of today. That is already true. Now you can't say, you know, did someone now come up with today and then say, hmm, let me create tomorrow, okay? No, if you provide today, you also have to provide the principle of tomorrow all simultaneously. However, the confusion now is, if we have today and tomorrow with all of these names and forms, including the suborders in today and tomorrow, like psychological laws, gravitational laws, chemical laws, etc., then why should this uh, be expressed in manifest? Why does it not just stay in all knowledge, all power? Right? Why do you have to have all of these names and forms and you know, this human drama of looking for who I am and going through this process of karma and, you know, going there and coming here or life after life, dying and living. Why not just remain as all knowledge, all power, everything's just perfect and there's no need to go chasing for this truth. There's no reason to, you know, to, to suffer. Fair question, right? So what is the relevance? of names and forms in this universe. Instead of saying, what is the purpose? We will say, what is the relevance of names and forms in this universe? So we will go to the Mandukya Karika, uh, chapter two, written by Gaudapada. And what did he say? He says, the only way to understand the purpose of creation of the universe is by understanding it from the standpoint of the jiva. Jiva just means the person, that means you. Again, he says, the only way to understand the purpose of the universe is by understanding it from the standpoint of the jiva. He says, all jivas come into existence. That's obvious, as do all other objects, because all knowledge, all power implies nothing is impossible. That means everything is already true. Yesterday is true, today is true. Everything already is. That includes the jiva, because jiva is not excluded from all knowledge, all power. And because the jiva comes, it requires a loka, a world, to experience. You can't just have a you know, jiva in a, in a white room. It's gonna do something. So the jiva comes, and you need to give the loka for the jiva for the sake of exhausting their karma, their punya and papa karma, right? Because how is the jiva going to exhaust their karma unless they have the world to engage with? Now, in keeping with their actions, with the jiva's actions, with your and my actions that we put out into this field, what do you have to have? Objects. In order to exhaust your punya papa karma, you need objects to engage with. And thus objects are also provided in the waking world. That's what your whole world of waking, isn't it? Just objects all around you. Now, what do you do with those objects? Do you leave them alone? No, what do you do? You handle them. You do things with them. You engage with them. Can you get yourself not to do that? Can you just like remain completely, you know, okay, objects are around me. Let's not do anything. No. In other words, you are compelled to handle the objects, to do something with the objects. So what happens now? 
So every experience that the jiva has is classified as either favorable or unfavorable. Is this your experience? That's what whole life is about, isn't it? It's either favorable or unfavorable. Is there anything in between? No. Now, if it's an unfavorable experience, what are you going to do? Are you going to go towards it or away from it? You're going to go away from an unfavorable experience. This is called nivrti. When there is an aversion towards an experience, I move away from it. This means my actions are about moving away, called nivrti. When there is a attachment or a favorable experience, what do we do? We find ourselves drawn to that experience. We want to work with it, engage ourselves with it. Then what happens? When we form these favorable and unfavorable, when we work with them, we form likes and dislikes. This causes us to develop habits. Habits of wanting to then further participate with what we like and what we don't like. So due to this process, there is a cycle of experience. There is likes and dislikes, and there is this moving towards pravrti, moving away from nivrti, constantly, endlessly. So I'm going to give you a simple English explanation of this so it doesn't sound so technical. Okay. So we asked, what's the purpose of all of this? As the person experiences and learns, is that what you're, you're doing in your life? You're doing nothing but experiencing and learning, aren't you? That's all life is about. As you experience and learn, you encounter favorable and unfavorable situations. And that leads to either creating attachments or aversions. And to create attachments and aversions, you then create a world to support those attachments and aversions. So the world today that we experience is a reflection of all of the attachments and aversions that the jivas have had in the past. For example, the jiva wants a quick telecommunication uh, system to communicate quickly. So what do we do? We think of fiber optics. We put it underneath the oceans. But that wasn't there only 100 years ago. So we have contributed to this world according to our attachments and aversions, to our likes and dislikes. Now, because of these likes and dislikes, more karmas get accumulated. And what happens then? Rebirth. Now, why does rebirth happen? Because there is no cause without effect. Every cause that I put out, there needs to be a follow-up effect. But because the body gets old and it cannot continue receiving the effects, then what happens? There is a new body given to receive the effects from the causes of the past life. And this happens life after life after life. Because where's the cause gonna go if there's only one reality, right? So if I, for example, you know, uh, steal something and then I die, where is that effect, where is the consequences of that stealing gonna go? Is it gonna like go to some random person in the other side of the world? <laughs> no. It has to come back to the person who engaged in the stealing. It has to come back to me. Thus, to receive the consequences, a new body gets born. Okay, let's change the topic. Misconceptions about Ishwara. Unless there's any questions so far. I just had a quick one, Andre. Is that the reason why Jeevas are born ignorant? Because if they weren't born ignorant, then they wouldn't be born at all. They have to be born ignorant to then exhaust the karma of the subtle body. Yeah, um, just, to, uh, just the fact of being reborn means that... Okay, go back to the beginning of the session, Thomas. The karmas belong to the body and the mind. Who am I? The body and the mind. So, the body-mind gets reborn... Since I am the body-mind, I continue enjoying or suffering those karmas. So this means as long as I'm still associated, my identity is placed in the body-mind, which hosts the karmas, there is rebirth. Because I always had the question, I was always thinking, why aren't we just born with knowledge? But I suppose that's a wrong question in itself. 
Yeah, it's yeah, okay. It's let's just put it this way. Um, I haven't taken time to investigate my nature because all knowledge come produces the whole entire universe of objects, including jivas. So nothing's wrong with that. But it's up to the jiva to inquire into if there's more to reality than just the jiva, than just the body mind. So until the jiva does that, he will continue or she will continue enjoying or suffering the consequences of their actions, enjoying or suffering the consequences. So it's not like being born is some you know, process that's evil and it's you know, a big setup there to hurt us and you know, cause us suffering. No, it's we cause suffering to ourselves through our own actions. But we're also given the knowledge to understand the bigger picture. So it is up to the jiva to end the cycle of this rebirth by understanding the nature of the reality of the jiva more than just the body mind. Okay. Now, the, now the misconceptions of Ishwara, the first one is, you know, where is this order? You know, you talk about orders, right? But where is this? All I see around me is suffering, violence, and poverty. It seems like the order itself is contaminated. That's the first argument that we often hear. And we need to correct this by firstly redefining what the word order means. Order just means the existence of cause and effect. To demonstrate this, everyone is endowed with dharma. That means the sense of right and wrong. But the human is also endowed with the ability to choose. This means I can choose to follow dharma or I can choose to put dharma aside. That's a fact. So if you don't follow dharma, then what happens? There's two results. First one is immediate. That means the immediate or the uh, instantaneous results. For example, if I lie and cheat, like right now, and you know, we're doing like a deal, like a trading deal, how am I gonna feel inside, even though you're not gonna see that on the outside? Yeah. Anything other than honest, anything other than genuine, anything other than authentic. Now, am I doing that? Am I like going, okay, now that I've lied, let me now press the guilty button on me. Am I doing it or is that coming by itself? It's coming by itself. Why? Because this means implies the existence of Dharma. This means if Dharma is violated, how do we know it's violated? Because it immediately provides feedback of guilt, of shame, of embarrassment. Now, the second result is future or unseen. So this means if I do something that is inappropriate, then the corresponding result will be produced in the future and that will let me know the inappropriateness of my action in the past. And I will be able to trace it back. I'll go, okay, so I'm now um, you know, having uh, this kind of problem because of that situation. So this means the future result will provide us feedback that we have done something inappropriate in the past. So these two results are always in operational because of Dharma. Uh, sorry to button, uh, yes. Andre. Uh, yes. Just a uh, slight doubt. Uh, like we are saying that we do sort of get an instant result, but a lot of times uh, the result of our action is not instantaneous and maybe we cannot correlate uh, the reaction with the current action as in it could be because of some past actions as well yeah. and how to sort of you know discriminate between what is right and what is wrong because a lot of things are not plain uh, black and white like in Mahabharat when yeah. it's sort of basic understood that we should not lie but even Yudhishthir um, had to lie sort of to protect dharma yeah uh, in yeah, the okay. case of the elephant and even Krishanji sort of uh, endorsed him, you know, lying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is sort of lying if you are sort of telling half truth. Sure. So in the, this is the sort of, uh, you know, situation that we would face normally that it's not so black and white. Yeah. So how do we sort of um, in our daily life uh, resolve all these conflicts because there is no guide that this is right, this is wrong. Yeah. So how do we develop that knowledge and that understanding yeah. so that we can discriminate between dharma and adharma? Yeah. Okay. Dharma is actually it's not a st it's not static. 
Uh, Dharma is flexible based on the circumstance. This is the, where the question arises from because we often think, okay, don't lie. So this means now if someone's in danger and they get, you know, go to my house and I say, please protect me. Uh, there's a thief coming after me. And I say, you know, okay, sure, please hide. And then the thief locks on my door and goes, hey, is, is she hiding here? What am I going to say? I'm going to say, yeah, yeah, sure. She's uh, right over there around the corner. Um, just take a left turn and then, you know, she's over there. What am I going to do? I'm going to lie to the thief. I'm going to say, no, I haven't seen her. Uh, uh, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Why? Because I, my dharma is protecting what I know to be right. How do I know what to be right? Because nobody wants to be hurt. So this means even though dharma is this sense of not hurting, it still has to be looked at from a standpoint of flexibility according to the situation. Or even a doctor, you know, if you take us under a surgeon's knife, you know, that is technically himsa, that is technically injury. But because the patient needs the doctor's help, he says, yes, please do hurt this body, do open this body up in order to help this body to heal. So firstly, that's the first point. Dharma is not static. It's not like just don't lie and, you know, no matter what. The second reason, uh, the way to discern between Dharma and Dharma is, uh, as we said, there's an immediate feedback. Now, this also goes into a complication of your past conditioning because sometimes, you know, we, we feel guilty for, um, for, for being, or, or shameful for being honest. We don't want to like, you know, say something because we feel ashamed. So there are, there are just multiple components that are uh, taking place when I'm trying to discern between Dharma and Adharma. But generally, to answer your question, it is the matter of that feedback. Do I feel guilty what I've done or not? It's simple as that. Like, do I feel uh, good about myself? And would I gladly, you know, do this again if the situation came about the second time? My only, uh, you know, to understand that, uh, like in case of Arjun, uh, if the feedback is like so quick, he would not be feeling guilty of, you know, fighting the war. At the end of the day, it was the right thing to do. But in his mind, he was ridden with guilt that he is going to kill so many people. So in, I'm just trying to understand in our daily life when situation is not so clear, you know, I, when I zoom out, I look at it from a third perspective. Me looking at Arjun, I can still be a little more objective and say that this is dharma, this is not dharma, this is a dharma. But when I'm Arjun, maybe it's not that easy to discriminate between what's right and what's wrong in that particular situation. Yeah, okay, that's true. So it's not easy in the moment. So one of the things that we can do is if you're not completely sure, then you just take a moment because the mind is not feeling completely clear. Um, so this means you take a moment to pause and go, okay, I need some time to, you know, to reflect on this. That's one of the things we can do. The second is uh, you can definitely resort to uh, past actions. So you can say, well, has this worked in the past and has it provided me a successful resolution or has it led to a state of conflict? And then you use the past knowledge to assess the current circumstance and you say, okay, so if I do what I've done last time, which has led to a conflict, then it's likely going to lead to a conflict again. So you look for a different way to approach the situation to bring about harmony between both sides. So this means not only should I profit, should I benefit, but also the other party should profit or benefit. So this means the question to your, uh, the answer to your question is, if only one party is to benefit, it is likely a dharma. There has to be full awareness, full alertness that it is not only good for me, but also it is good for the other. For example, if the mother takes ice cream from the child, it looks like himsa, right? Like injury. But the mother's doing that because the mother knows if the child has two ice creams, there's going to be hyperactivity in two hours. And that's not going to be good for the child's concentration. They're going to put a tantrum. So it looks like initially that the mother is causing harm, but she's actually thinking ahead. Now the mother may th feel guilty, like, oh, you know, poor child it deserves a nice second ice cream. So this means now the mother also has her own guilt to get through. But end of the day, 
how do you know whether you're applying dharma or dharma? Both parties need to profit, need to benefit, need to have a successful uh, resolution when the decision is made. That's the general rule, both, not just one, because then it becomes about you. When it becomes about me, then it's himsa, most likely, because it's disregarding another life form, another sentient human being who also has emotions and a sense of purpose uh, in life. All right, thank you. Okay, so um, getting back, so let's conclude what I said so far. So the conclusion is the, okay, so there's a presence of this order. And if I go out of this order, which is called Adharma, then I get this feedback. Um, for example, can you blame global warming on this order? No. The order simply provides cause and effect. It is the human being's own overconsumption that is causing the global warming. So this means we're getting feedback how? Through global warming, increase of temperatures, wild or, uh, weather that is much wilder. So this means if one wishes to receive a successful result, a much a greater, a more favorable result, it is up to the individual to change his or her approach so that it is more conducive in bringing about a favorable result. It's got nothing to do with the order itself. The order is just facilitating the person's action. But how, what the person receives is entirely up to their own actions. This is what we mean by cause and effect. So this means your life is entirely a result of the actions that you're putting out into the field. So there's no one to blame here. It's entirely up to me because even if I'm blaming someone, that is another action I'm putting into the field. And what am I getting out of that? A need to blame again. And that is causing suffering to whom? Myself. So I need to change my approach. Okay, and there's actually a nice story. I'm taking the story mode now um, to illustrate uh, how shallow our understanding is of Ishwara of God, uh, or these laws, which are an expression of Ishwara. Uh, there was a story of a, a barber and he was given a haircut to a client. And the client asked the, the barber, uh, is there God? And then the client said, uh, no. Uh, no. So it's the client asked the barber, is there God? And the barber said, no, there is no God. Uh, and then the client said, well, there is God. And then the barber says, hmm. You know, if there is God, then why is there so much suffering in the world? And the barber kind of felt, you know, proud of his uh, rationale. And this is a common thing that you hear, you know, this kind of logic. No, if there is a God, then why all the suffering and, you know, these unnecessary uh, situations in life? So then <clears throat> after, the short, after the haircut, the client goes out and then he finds a man with a messy, ungroomed hair, like totally messy. And he takes the man into the barber shop and he says to the barber, hey barber, there is no barber in this world. And the barber's like, what are you talking about? I just gave you a haircut. How can you say that there is no barber in this world? I just gave you a haircut. And then the client says, well, look at this man here. If there was a barber in the world, then there would be order to this man's hair. This man's hair would be groomed, it would not be as messy. And then a barber thought about it. Hmm, good point. Barber now kind of traced back how this applies to the question of God. In other words, the barber realized just because a barber exists in the world doesn't mean the person is going to take advantage and bring their hair in order. It is still up to the person to walk into the barber's shop and say, please, make my hair in order. Luciana. I was thinking, so maybe that's what's free will, like you give the material to Ishvara, do the whole thing, kind of something like that, or I'm wrong? Uh, no, um, okay, you're right. So it is free will and that free will, I fully have the chance to exercise. And if I don't exercise it, then, I get messy, ungroomy hair. And what's the result of that? Uh, people give me funny looks. No one's attracted to me. Who suffers? I suffer. 
Why? Because I'm not aligning myself with the barber. If I just say, hey, barber, the one who's been there all along, please make my life in order. The barber is gladly going to help you. And thus, I'm going to be shiny and attractive. And then my life is going to change because of that. So it is entirely up to me to still take advantage to align myself with Ishwara's laws and orders that we discussed last week so that I may live a successful life. So going back to the question, you know, if there was God, then why is this world in such a state that it is? The answer is simple, because despite the presence of laws and orders everywhere, the person simply is focusing on the beads. And because I'm focusing on the beads, then I miss the presence of the one string, which is in and through all beads. That means the laws and orders, which if I were to align myself with them, then my life would be in order. Another misconception of, uh, in regards to Ishwara is uh, that Ishwara has likes and dislikes. Uh, and that Ishwara is the one who punishes one person and rewards another person. And the rationale behind this, you heard this before, right? Is the one that punishes and rewards. Very common in the West. The reason for this is there is this idea that all knowledge, all power is creates the world and then it stands apart from the world. And then it goes, okay, now that I've created the world, let me just sit down and just rest and enjoy who's doing uh, my work and who's against my work. And whoever's against my work, I'm going to punish them. Who's doing my work, I'm going to reward them. So this is a common idea that goes on. And this creates this question that, you know, now Ishwara is the, the, uh, the punisher. And it creates this idea that Ishwara is a wrathful God who is all loving, who somehow doesn't have the ability to forgive because, you know, if he would forgive, then the person would be free after they do something that is uh, unwise, but the person suffers. So obviously Ishwara is not forgiving, but he's all loving. So this, another conflict gets created due to this idea. Um, now, the, the, the Gita makes a correction to this. What does Gita say? It says that Ishwara is impersonal. What do you mean by impersonal? It says that Ishwara, that is the cause of the universe, is not a person, but an all intelligent order, which simply facilitates the actions of your results. Impersonal. To give you an analogy of this, imagine there's a tree and you decide to rub yourself against that tree. What happens? You get hurt. Now it's true. The tree is the cause of your hurt. That is true. But can you hold the tree accountable for that hurt? No. The tree was just standing there, minding its own business. Its agenda was neither to hurt nor to not hurt. It was me in response to the tree that caused the hurt to happen. In the same way with Ishwara. If I suffer, it is because my own actions cause that. If I have a, non a wonderful life, it is because my own actions produce that. So yes, it is true the tree caused. It is true Ishwara causes one to suffer. But it is not true that Ishwara caused the suffering. It is my response to the laws and orders that cause the suffering. Okay, another misconception. Another misconception which we talked about last week was uh, there is a, um, uh, when did all knowledge, all power begin? Right? It's a linear thinking. And we said it didn't because all knowledge, all power manifests as names and forms but also has an unmanifest state. This means names and forms simply are in an unmanifest. So there's two states, manifest and unmanifest, and they are eternally changing. Manifest, unmanifest, just like your thoughts. One moment it's manifest, next moment it's unmanifest, constantly like that. So there's no question of beginning. The third misconception is, or whatever this uh, conception, I think it's number four now, is Ishwara is energy. Is this true? No. Ishwara is not energy. Why is Ishwara not energy? 
because energy doesn't have the intelligence to organize itself. It's just energy, like thermonuclear energy, nuclear energy, heat energy. It still doesn't have a res uh, the intelligence to organize itself and thus serve its function in response to another form. And also we said that energy itself exists in time and space, just like matter, energy and matter. Just at, uh, energy is just more subtle. The other misconception is one of my favorites. Ishwara knows what's going to happen in the future, including your life. Ishwara has the big picture. And, uh, you know, if you access some details, you go maybe to a, a, a a reader, a clairvoyant reader, or some kind of a tarot card reader, they can kind of access that knowledge and tell you where your life is going to go. No. Are you away from Ishwara? Is the bead away from Ishwara? No. So this means everyone contributes to the field. No one is away from the field. If you ask Ishwara 300 years ago, what is 200 and 2020 year, what is that going to look like? Ishwara is going to say, I have no clue. It depends on you because you are not apart from me. So if you start to overconsume, then in 2020, we're going to have a global warming problem. If you stop consuming in 1800s or 1900s, then in 2020, we're not going to have global warming problem. In other words, we all contribute. Thus, it is impossible to tell the future. Everything is in a flux. There's no such thing as a static, predetermined life here. And probably my favorite misconception of all is, okay, other worlds, since we're, you know, talk about the Upanishads, the 14 Lokas, have much greater civilizations, more sophisticated civilizations than we have here in this world. So this means they're knowledge of Ishwara is way more sophisticated than ours on earth. They have the Vedas. There is so much more advanced than ours. Ours is just, you know, minuscule. Why is this a logical problem? Let's ask, what is the definition of the universe? Time, space, objects out of one cause, not two causes, one cause. So any logic that applies in this world also applies in any world, no matter how sophisticated or advanced it is. Even a civilization 10 trillion years ahead of us in capacity to think is no different in the fundamental principles of life than is true right here on earth. Whatever is true over there in that world, is also true over here in this world, fundamentally. It may be more like a, you know, a lighter, subtle body or uh, something that is you know, more rainbows or something, you know, but the basis is still the same because it's coming from the one cause. Therefore, I don't need to spend my time fascinating myself with other worlds. All I need to know is the one cause which pervades all worlds automatically I am in touch with all worlds from that standpoint. So instead of wasting my time and going, let me investigate about, you know, the channeling beings who are, you know, from over there in that star system who are telling us how to live here. Instead of wasting my time on that, I just understand the cause that made those beings is the same cause that made us right here, right now. Thus, where does my attention go? On the cause itself and not on other worlds. And automatically, I am at peace with the entire universe if I am in touch with the cause in the, of the one thread which pervades all beads, including all worlds. So this is a big transformation that has in terms of your life. You're no longer fascinated about, you know, what's out there. Let's travel to these different worlds. And this is why the Vedas, by the way, can postulate the 14 lokas because they say there's 14 lokas. Now you say, well, how, how do they know that? Well, according to this logic, because there's one cause that is in and through all beads, all worlds. So let's summarize and then we'll continue the, uh, the next topic. Yes, Robert. Uh, in the Upanishads, it says there are 14 lokas. 
But it says only two of those Lakers are suitable for Moksha. Yeah. Uh, being Brahma Laker and, and where we are now. But if it's the same principle that applies across all the Lakers, how can that be the case? How can be what the case? Say again. If, it, if the same principle of Ishwara applies across all Lakers, yeah. how can you then make a distinction of limit to only two that allow Moksha? Yeah, okay, the logic for that is uh, quite simple because uh, Brahma Loka is the highest, the most subtle sloka before the formless. And on earth, it is a, there is a, a mixture of punya and papa. So we all come on earth with a mixture of punya. So it's a stable experience. You're neither absolutely good, neither are you absolutely inappropriate. So, we, we, so learn the earth itself is a learning experience. It causes us to think. It gives us opportunity to contemplate. Whereas these other lokas, they're a lot more unstable. There is either total exhaustion of the punya or there is exhaustion of the, of the uh, papa. So the person is in, the jiva that is engrossed in the process of, you know, in, in exhausting their karmas. So they're not thinking about the knowledge. So it's not like you cannot gain moksha in these other worlds. It's just that the two most conducive lokas are the, are the uh, world that we're experiencing now and the Brahma loka. Yeah. So it's just a matter of stability. If you go to, for example, Swarga Loka, the way the Upanishads, the, the Vedas describe it, it's so beautiful. It's like the pleasures are incredible. Uh, there's no death. There's no hunger. And you just totally enjoy yourself. The most, the greatest experience that the person could imagine, it's all there in Swarga Loka. Now, if you're enjoying yourself, are you thinking about the existence purpose of life? <laughs> no. Uh, you're just enjoying, you're just reveling in the enjoyment. But on earth, it is not like that. It is punya and papa, and that causes suffering. And suffering causes us to think about the meaning of life. And thinking instigates the inquiry. And inquiry releases us from suffering, discovering my nature is other than who I thought I was, the body and the mind. Yeah. Okay, so summary is all knowledge, all power. The one all knowledge, all power appears as names and forms in this universe. So wherever you look, even if you look at your hand right now, you look at this room that you're in, all knowledge, all power is appearing as every form that we're witnessing right now. That's it, the one same cause. Now the next question is, what is the relationship between the universe of names and forms and all knowledge, all power? that is Ishwara. What's the relationship between this world and Ishwara? Like if you look at your hand right now, what's the relationship between this hand and all knowledge, all power? How do we bring it into a more practical, livable, understandable format? Because so far we've been almost talking about theory, but now let's bring it into a more down to earth, practical understanding. And we're gonna say, start out like this, the world that we witness, everything around you, it does not enjoy an absolute reality. It only enjoys a relative reality. So what does this mean? Well, you can go back to that mountain example. The mountain does not enjoy an absolute reality of a mountain, because if you look deeper into a mountain, it actually resolves into a smaller constituent. So the question is, what is the status of this world? like the world that we see. Is it an illusion? Is it real? Is it unreal? What's the status of this world? And when I say a world, I'm not talking about, you know, just the world, but I'm talking about your body, your own thoughts that are also part of the world. So far, what have we seen? We have seen that the universe is apparent. Example, the mountain. It is apparent. But it ultimately resolves into all intelligence. So mountain, rock, minerals, atoms, particles, quartz, space, and space itself resolves into intelligence. So all objects resolve into name form within name form within name form within name form. So you cannot actually give an absolute reality to anything because the moment you look at it, you go, okay, it's a mountain. But when you look deeper into it, it's a rock. But you look deeper into it, it's a mineral, and it's so on, 
right? So now what is the reality of the world if this is the state of the scheme of things? In other words, what I want to say is you cannot find any final substance in this world that is the cause of all manifestations. If you say atom, is that the final substance of everything? No. Why? Because it resolves deeper into something else. That means unless our instruments are, as long as our instruments are limited, we say, okay, well, that's the final reality. But the moment our instruments improve, we go, ah, okay, it wasn't the final reality. So there's no substance in this world, which is the final substance of all manifestations. Because if you look into any form, it resolves into a smaller form. But at the same time, you cannot st state that the world does not exist. You cannot say that the mountain does not exist, that the tree doesn't exist, the sun doesn't exist. Why can you not say that? Because it does exist. I'm looking at it. it sun, that's why we give it a name called sun. You cannot say that the atom doesn't exist. Because I'm looking at it under a microscope, atom. So the question is, or the conclusion is, there is no object in this world has absolute reality. But at the same time, you cannot dismiss objects as unreal. You understand that? Why? Because it enjoys this in-between reality. It is neither absolutely real, neither is it completely false. So how do you resolve this paradox? So the Upanishads now introduce two new terms. One is satyam and one is mitya. And this helps us to explain reality in terms of its status. For example, you look at your hand. This hand is a form and its form resolves into a smaller form. And this hand thus has a satya-mitya relationship. Now, before I explain this relationship, let's talk about these two terms. Satyam means that which is independent, that which stands or remains independent. And mitya means that which depends upon something else for its existence. In this case, satyam, because that's the only other option. There's only two, satya, mitya. So mitya depends on satyam for its existence. Now to give you context of this, we can say that every object that you see is empirically true. Look at your hand, please. Your hand right now is empirically true. What does empirically mean? Empirically means through observation, I say hand, and it is true. It's empirically true because through my observation, objectively, it is a hand. Therefore, it is mitya. Why is it mitya? Because it resolves into something else. What does it resolve into? Cells. It is dependent upon cells. It is dependent upon atoms and so on. So any object, including your hand, is empirically true, but it is mitya. So I just want to clarify what this word mitya means. First of all, mitya does not mean it's totally false. This is a misconception. It does not mean it's an illusion. So you cannot brush the world as an illusion or a false, you know, it's a false word. Because this word, false and illusion, they're very common. They go on in, the, um, in this world of uh, Vedanta. Mitya just means it's empirically true. It means it is not totally real, nor totally false. So your hand that you've been looking at, this hand is neither totally real nor totally false. It enjoys an in-between reality. Okay, so what is this um, relationship between Satya and Mitya? Take, for example, the table. I hope your table is wooden. Just imagine it's a wooden table. So your table is mitya. Why is it mitya? Okay, what does mitya mean? It's dependent. Because the table is dependent upon the wood. 
So this means the table is Mitya and the wood is Satyam. Now, if you look at it from the standpoint of the wood, the wood becomes Mitya, but what does wood depend on? Cellulose and lignin. So now cell, let's just take cellulose, becomes Satyam, wood is now Mitya. Now cellulose you look into, that becomes Mitya, what is now Satyam, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. You just take oxygen. What is oxygen now? Oxygen is now Mitya and, okay, I will see Dave. Okay, I will see, thank you. Okay, oxygen is now Mitya and what does oxygen depend on? Atoms, atomic number eight. Atom becomes Satyam. Uh, in fact, speaking of this Satyam Mitya, I want to show you some more visuals to wake us up. Okay. So here, let me just put the volume down. I can't put the volume down, can I? Okay. Can you hear me? Shake your hand. Okay, good. So if you look at, for example, a human being, we now go into a smaller and smaller, we'll just start from a human being. So here's, uh, you know, two people. And then we keep on going smaller into, uh, okay, here's a human embryo. And then we go into a cell. So this is the cell we were talking about. So now the cell is Satyam and the human embryo is Mitya. But now if you look deeper into the cell, you arrive to, for example, uh, where's our DNA? I think this is DNA here, DNA structure. So now DNA becomes Satyam and the human cell becomes Mitya. Now if you go even deeper, we go into atoms. Now what is a human DNA made of? Atoms. Here's the oxygen atom, number eight, and the hydrogen atom, which are required to make water, by the way. So water is mitya, but from the standpoint of the oxygen and hydrogen, they become satyam. But now you look deeper into both of them, you resolve them further into, let's see here, into subatomic particles, electron, positron. And then you go further, and you ultimately end up at length to length, which I explained last week. That is the smallest measurement. That means right after the manifestation of the universe, what was the first length? The Planck length. And that Planck length also is resolved into where? All knowledge, all power. So this means all knowledge, all power becomes the ultimate Satyam. And everything since the Big Bang, that is the Planck length, and the next smaller elements, subatomic particles, and then you've got atomic nuclei, atoms, DNA structure, cells, all of that becomes Mitya. Therefore, all knowledge, Satyam, everything else, Mitya. Because what is a man made of? Nothing but atoms. Atoms make up DNA. DNA makes up cells and so on. Okay, I hope you heard me. Did you hear me? Oh, yes, it was dramatic and beautiful, like a sci-fi movie. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you should do that more often. <laughs> oh, yay. Uh, I hope I'm not sounding boring just by just speaking all this technical language. Uh, okay, so the conclusion is if every form that you've just now seen is Mitya, then what is the reality which every form depends on? I said all knowledge, all power. Therefore, all knowledge, all power becomes Satyam, which even time space itself resolves into. Therefore, if you look into any form, what do you find? You find the presence of all pervading intelligence that appears as atoms, positron, nuclei, DNA, embryo, human being, ostrich, egg, mountain, planet, solar system, bigger, bigger, and bigger, and bigger, okay? What puts them together? All knowledge, all power. So let's put a summary of Satya Mitya. What is Mitya? 
Metya means or refers to objects. Object means names and forms manifest of one intelligence, satyam. Mitya is also inclusive of unmanifest because a mitya object that is not here now will be here in one second from now or one year from now. So whether we're talking manifest or unmanifest, both mitya. What is satyam? Satyam is the one intelligence which puts all mitya objects together, as you've just seen in that diagram. It puts the subatomic particles together to create atoms, atoms together to create cells and so on. So mitya objects themselves are also what? Satyam intelligence. Therefore, there is no such thing as material in this universe. There is only knowledge appearing as objects. One satyam intelligence appearing as mitya objects. And the mitya objects themselves resolve into one satyam intelligence. Therefore, all around us is all knowledge, all power appearing as the material universe. Okay, so how to demonstrate this? That suppose now you say, how do you, how does satyam retain itself without being contaminated by the mitya objects? It's very simple. When you dream, you are what? You are the satyam of your dream mitya world. But do any of those dream mitya objects stick to you? No. In other words, even though you're the satyam, the all knowledge, all power of the dream, the dream, which is nothing but mitya world, mitya objects, it does not affect you, the one in whom the entire dream is appearing, the cause of the entire dream. So therefore, even though you are all that is, you still don't get affected by what is produced, what is projected, that is the world of mitya objects. Therefore, you remain completely free, independent of everything. Just like Ishwara remains completely independent, free of anything that happens in this universe. All knowledge, all power remains one. What happens in the universe depends on the laws and orders in response to the objects and the jivas, according to their actions. Okay, and what happens if you don't know about satya-mitya relationship? What is the implications to our life? The implications is a world of dvaita, the world of duality. And this is uh, the whole world of spirituality. Most of it is just loaded with these ideas of uh, worlds and you know trying to figure out this and trying to figure out that whereas in actuality there is one cause from which everything comes so my relationship again changes to everything by the recognition of the one string which is in and through everything so this means there is no such thing as object and intelligence there is only one intelligence appearing as objects. What you see right in front of you right now is a monitor. And we say, oh, okay, so this is material and you know, oh, okay, so there's material now. No, resolve this into a smaller constituent. And what do you arrive to? All knowledge, all power. Because it's an element dug from earth. Earth is atoms, atoms is particles and so on. So all around you, there is only knowledge called Ishwara. Okay, and finally, I would like to conclude by uh, stating the re how do you recognize this or appreciate this cause of the universe, all knowledge, all power. The cause of the universe is not a matter of belief, first of all, because we're not talking about something in the future. We're talking about what is true right now, right here, what's making you function, what's making you listen to this or not listen, I don't know which one of those it is. I hope it's the first one. And the cause is the cause of all names and forms. And if you examine it to any name and form, what do you come up to? 
you, you find there is one intelligence that makes possible all of the connections that are occurring right now between your heart, between your head, between your brain, between the, the cells, between the air. The air is responding to the lungs. The lungs are convert, uh, drawing the oxygen into the blood. All of theirs, uh, these are interactions in accordance with these laws and orders. And some of the examples that we can recognize the beauty of, these, uh, of this intelligence is, for example, if you, um, how long would a human being take to figure out how far the sun needs to be away from the earth to sustain human life? How long would it take you to figure that out? A long time. The sun is placed exactly at the right distance to harbor life on earth. This is not an accident. Or if you look at bees, bees are quite amazing. Um, did you know that bees, they actually, uh, they air condition their hive because it's quite hot in the hive, you know, the temperature's high up. Now, how do the bees cool that hive down? They flap their wings. Did the bees come up with this? They go, hmm, you know, it's kind of hot here. How do we bring an air conditioning here? Let's just maximize the use of our wings. It's inbuilt. The intelligence comes inbuilt. And what else do bees do? They create a, a honeycomb structure, a hexagonal shape. Now, what do human beings do? We go, oh, that's quite a strong structure. So we take a hexagonal structure and we create the roofs out of it. Or in your laptops, you often hear, oh, it's a laptop with a, you know, a bee, bee, beehive hexagonal structure. So we take the forces of nature, which is from all knowledge, all power, and then we make a product out of it to prop it and create a structurally strong design. Or an octopus, you see an octopus which changes, mimics its texture and color according to the surface it lays on? Amazing, huh? I mean, it doesn't even take a moment to kind of like analyze, mm, let me analyze the structure, mm, mm, let me plan how I'm gonna do this. It just lands on a, you know, a, a color or a shape and its entire body mimics that in what, one second. Think about the intelligence behind this. Absolutely phenomenal. We talked about a spider last week. Creates a wonderful, structurally strong spider's web. It doesn't think about, you know, let me go to a library and learn how to make a web. It comes inbuilt with this intelligence. And you look at the spiders, it's quite amazing how it's made, you know, it weaves it automatically, coming from itself. Or if you want to get electrocuted, you just go find an electric eel, you know, get a nice shock there. Now, how does electric eel make electricity? Amazing, huh? We still haven't found a way how to do that ourselves. An electric eel comes with a method to produce electricity without power generators and coal and burning fossil fuels and so on, intelligence. Or ants, what do ants do? They create a bridge across a path of water. You've seen that, right? And then other ants can transverse, they can come over them from one side to the other. Imagine that, the ant sees a little patch of water and goes, hmm, how do we get to the other side? And what do they do? They create a bridge out of themselves so that the other ants can walk across them and get to the other side. Intelligence. It's not like the ants are starting to plan, you know, how to get to the other side. It's inbuilt. Who thinks of this? <laughs> then you got animals with a process of chemiluminescence. Chemiluminescence is when the enzymes of protein and um, the enzyme and protein combines together. And what does it do? It lights up the animal, the eyes, like the owl's eyes or the, or the fish or a certain jellyfish. If you look in the ocean, it lights up. It produces light with minimum heat production. And the closest human beings that come up to this is LED lights. In other words, they produce light without producing heat. And we're still trying to figure this out, how to do intelligence. 
rats, what do rats do? They chew all their life. Now, what are the rat's teeth like? One side of the teeth is soft. The other side of the rat's teeth is hard. So when they chew, the softer side wears out faster. What does this do? It keeps the teeth sharp for the entire life. So what do we do? We then create a self-sharpening saw by mimicking the teeth of the rat. Now, what did the rat do? Hmm, I need sharp teeth. Let me, let me design a sharp. No, it's intelligence that creates this. And then we human beings use that for our own advantage. Then you got the snowy tree cricket. It chirps exact amount of times as the air temperature. 32 degrees, what does a snowy tree cricket do? It chirps 32 beats per minute. 15 degrees, it beats 15 beats per minute. It doesn't use a thermometer. Oh, let me use it to measure what's the temperature outside so I can chirp that many times. Intelligence. And you've got eight planets around the sun. Keeping the exact schedule, never one minute off or one hour off. Oh, sorry, we're late. We're talking about eight planets in perfect synchronization around the sun never one minute or one hour off year after year millions of years never late never early intelligence so we can appreciate intelligence wherever you see in any aspect of life so all natural phenomena that we explained brings out the beauty of all intelligence if you look into it and there is no way a human being can come up with this okay What's the time? Okay, let's close. So what have I shown you so far? I've shown you that any object is a form within a form. Have we understood this? Okay, good. And any form is as though, because if you look at it from another standpoint, then it no longer enjoys its previous name form. The name form mountain is as though, but if I look at it from a different standpoint of the rock, the mountain no longer enjoys its previous name form mountain. We have got up to this so far. But all names forms, we also resolve, we, we've also seen that they all resolve into what? All knowledge, all power. Now, the next question will be, where does all knowledge, all power come from? This is what Mina asked last week. In other words, there is one more final reality that we have to talk about. The reality which is the closing to the equation of the vision of oneness. So this means, what have we done so far? We have investigated into the nature of I. We have seen the nature of the universe, satya mitya relationship. All around us, we see all knowledge, all power appearing as the beads which we talk about from birth to death all resolves into the same intelligence now this intelligence if you think about it needs to create but how do you create you need something else you need to be conscious in order to create just like a human being needs to be conscious to create his little house in the same way ishwara needs to be conscious to create the entire universe Therefore, we will talk about this final reality next week and then close the vision of oneness and bring a resolution to the total big picture, the big puzzle. And then we can begin uh, our Bhagavad Gita. Okay. Any comments? How was today? Was it dragging on? I have to say, I got a little conflict inside me when you say that uh, Ishvara doesn't know the future and about this idea of free will because I always um, thought that this big intelligence, okay, we have to do our part and I understand all that. And, uh, but on the small picture, on the big picture, 
this intelligence knows exactly what's going on, I thought, and uh, we are all part of this big puzzle to make everything work. But uh, so it's like I got a little conflict about that. And I thought like uh, free will is just an idea and deep inside we don't have free will. But then I got a little disturbed <laughs> with the idea now. Yeah, it's not like um, we, yeah, we do have free will, but it's not like we have total control. We do have some control, but not total control. See, if you had total control, you would, your life would be working exactly the way that you wanted right now. You would say, okay, let's stop COVID, but no one has that control. So we need to abide where our circle of control is. That's where our control stays. If we try to go outside our circle of control, life becomes a conflict of struggle and confusion because we're trying to make life according to our needs or according to our wants. But then you recognize at the same time, you don't have no control of the weather, right? Over, you know, tomorrow cancer suddenly comes. It's like, where did this come from? You know, I was being a healthy person. So we do still have some control, but not absolute control. This is the understanding. And because this universe is a governed by law of karma and dharma, that is cause and effect, this means the universe is nothing but a response, a reflection to all of the events that are taking place, including the meteors that are smashing against each other, the supernovas that are being born, the galaxies that are being created, the jiva's actions that are um, you know, causing um, a, a world to be created. If you ask, why do we have 14 lokas? It's very simple to satisfy the need of the jiva's desires. Because if the jiva wants nothing but to uh, engage in sensual pleasure, then the earth is not good enough. It needs a different world for that. So a new loka gets created just to help the jiva exhaust their need for their sensual grat gratification. So even the worlds themselves, the 14 lokas, are in response to the, the needs of the jiva, to the which is accordingly a result of their free will. You know, why do you have, why do you have Swarga Loka? Because the one who does rituals and does, you know, enough Punya Karma on earth, then after death, they get a world that is deserving of that kind of effort because the world is not sufficient for, for helping them exhaust that enjoyment. So they need to go to a better world. Or they do go to a better world, not that they need to. Yes, he said, yeah, but... But, but all that's created by this big intelligence, right? So actually this big intelligence knows everything and uh, we have no power anyway at the end. <laughs> I don't know. It's like uh, today actually I got a little, because I, I like this big intelligence, which yeah. creates everything, which when the octopus goes on the rock, goes like that in one second. Yeah. We are also part of that. The only difference is that we think we can think, but actually at the end, we are also controlled by this big intelligence which knows everything and does everything and has the material to create everything. So Okay, good. Um, there's a confusion between when I say all knowledge, that means when I say all knowledge, it just means all knowledge of everything, every object, every law. But when I say all knowledge, the common confusion is, oh, okay, so it also has knowledge of the future. You see how the word all knowledge can be taken as two different things, even though I'm not talking about knowledge of the future. I'm talking about the knowledge of what is of, of atom, of molecules, of you know, hydrogen, oxygen. All of that comes together according to the laws and orders. And the laws and orders are there to uphold this universe so that the jiva can continue exalting their karma. So when I say all knowledge, I'm not referring to about knowledge about what is to happen. That's a different, that's a misconception which we covered. That is not possible to be told because the universe is a constant, is a constant flux, constant change according to the karma exhaustion of the jivas. Yeah, so that's the confusion there. Andre, can you, can you say, Ishwara knows what's gonna happen, but he doesn't interfere with the world. Then he becomes a person. So he knows what's going to happen in 10 years' time because he's all knowledge of power. No. It's but he doesn't control. interfere with the world. He lets, no. it, lets it go. Yeah. I like what the uh, Al Gore in 2000, I think, said uh, when the, it was Inconvenient Truth was in the show. 
someone asked him, you know, okay, so having shown us all of this ice uh, glaciers that are now breaking apart in the world is uh, experiencing a, uh, you know, the thinning of the ozone layer. What's going to happen in 10 years, Mr. Al Gore? He said, very simply said, it depends on what we do today. Simple as that. There's no question of knowing what's going to happen in the future because it's up to you to make a decision now that's going to change what's going to happen in the future in 10 years. Nobody knows the future, not even Ishwara. I've been thinking yeah. about how we uh, often project onto Ishvara you know, ideas of our, our mind, like that we think and decide. So like David was saying, like, doesn't Ishwara know about this? But Ishwara, Ishwara isn't a mind that has an idea and just one thing, is it? It's... Yeah. That's what I got to. That's what I'm trying to struggle with now is is trying to relate to Ishwara because usually I'm trying to relate to him as another person, but it's not like that. It's not like a person who has thoughts, a mind which is limited to one thing at a time. Whereas this other presence that we are mm -hmm. somehow has everything at the same time. You know, it has all, I don't know if you call it thought, but. Yeah. Um, you know, when you dream, you don't dictate what happens in the dream. Even yeah. though you're the cause of the dream, the dream cannot be without you. And yet you're not the one that's dictating who does what in the dream, what parties take place and uh, what worlds get born and so on. That is according to the character's own decisions but you're the one that's supplying all of the material and intelligence for characters to do what they wish to do, for the plants to grow, for the cells to multiply. But you don't interfere. You're not saying, I want cell over there in that location to multiply. That's happening because two people came together and they're making a baby. But you didn't do that. So Ishwara just means the intelligence which facilitates the actions of the universe, of the jiva. See, without think, see, even to, you know, think, you need, you know, electrical impulses to move. That is being done for you. That's Ishwara. But I'm still thinking through my own decisions. But those decisions, that thinking is possible because of Ishwara's laws and orders. So there's a subtle distinction between um, thinking that Ishwara is interfering and understanding that Ishwara is simply that which supplies everything in which I, as a person, can make decisions and make my life in a you know, more evolved fashion, in a more evolved manner. Yeah. Andre, mm -hmm. I, I sort of seem to recognize something here. It's like the animals, they all they, I mean, they all cre created also equally like us, uh, but the animals actually do the same thing in each species. But as a human, each one of us act differently with what we have in our mind and our karmas, our past actions. Uh, I think that's the biggest difference between animals and us, uh, because we think we like to make individual decisions and we put a boundary among ourselves. And uh, that's why we see the differences in each other. So I don't think animals do that because animals all behave the same way. There is no, you don't see an animal, one animal out of character street, you know, with the other animals. Yeah. All <laughs> elephants are the same. All tigers are the same. Yeah. All lions are the same. But as human beings, we all the same and yet we see so much of differences. In us. Uh, so I think that is where, even though we're given the material and uh, you know the, all knowledge and intelligence and everything else but we tend to use our mind thinking that we are individual and make our own decisions and then we of course suffer for the consequences we make sometimes so that, that that's that's the difference i see and that's what i'm trying to understand and i think that's where i think i don't know i mean it was created for all of us to be to see the oneness but we are not because we put a boundary among ourselves I think uh, that is where we have to work on, I think. 
we have um, to uh, just okay. yeah animals um uh, there's some echo i don't know why there's echo yeah animals have um also are different because no two tigers are the same you know they also have a personality like cats some cat is patient some cat wants to scratch you all day um i would prefer the patient cat though um so the cat also has a personality of its own so this means it has its own um not only collective sameness with other cats, but it also has enjoys a separateness that is a, a, a unique character about itself. That's why I know two cats are the same, even though they're cats, right? the family of cats. What the cat doesn't have is the ability to say, I think my owner doesn't like me. Um, and then cat, you know, finds a psychological help for that. So because we're given the freedom to think, be self-conscious about our own thoughts, then we create these complications and then we create, you know, schools like psychology and uh, therapy to help us deal with our own thoughts, our own stories, our own narratives that we create about our own thoughts in response to or in connection with everything else out there. But the cat doesn't have that ability. So the cat just simply plays out a natural dynamic program that is to eat, to protect its young, to sleep, and to survive. Now, we also do that as human beings, right? We can't help ourselves to eat, to survive, to protect ourselves, but we enjoy one extra ability that is to be conscious of our protection, to our, of our survival, of our eating. And because of that self-consciousness, then we make decisions. Oh, okay, I don't want to eat one thing. Uh, I want to eat something else. Okay, Mama, Mama Ta, okay, thank you for coming. Yeah, so it's because of this freedom, it's kind of like a double-edged sword, right? It not only makes us, gives us the ability to grow, but also it can be a suppression mechanism. It can hinder us because we, you know, make a story about uh, everything in life. That's the nature of the world, isn't it? If you get the ability to think, you also have to... Uh, enjoy the or suffer the consequences of that ability and that is you know you make complications about your life okay so next week we make uh, we close the picture of the big vision and bring all of this together into an understand into a full understanding sarve bhavantu sikinaha sarve santu niramayaha sarve bhagdrani pashyantu Ma kashchit duhka bhag bhavet Om shanti 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 hi